um, welcome to the Basel Company and Outwards uh, virtual event. Um, I'm going to introduce Carl Setmary and uh, Larry Willock on Outwards. Do you guys have anything you want to mention? Uh, I know we're doing this partly uh, at, with your uh, men's book club. Uh, I hope there are people our men's book club here. I guess the only thing I wanted to mention is that we meet uh, the second Tuesday of every month. On second Monday. I'm sorry, the second Monday of every month. Uh, three people here corrected me. <laughs> second Monday of every month and our next meeting will be April 12th because that's the second Monday. And we'll be uh, reading a book called The Prophets. And because I didn't know I was going to introduce that, I don't have the author's name in front of me, Carl. Go with Robert Jones Jr. That's it, Robert Jones Jr. I knew it when you said it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a spectacular book, and I think it's a really great book for a book club discussion because you want you want to bounce stuff off of people afterwards, yeah. definitely. So we'll, we'll, we'll be doing that. Yes, we are, uh, would like to now introduce um, Zach Salad, the author of Let's Get Back to the Party. Um, we are uh, thrilled to have him for his uh, debut novel. His work has appeared in Crazy Horse, The Millions, The Rumpus, and other publications, um, we would love, first of all, welcome virtually to Milwaukee. Um, Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to all of you. <laughs> I know the travel was murder. It, you know, it was getting off my couch to come here. The, the rush hour was crazy. You probably had to change virtually in Chicago, which is a terrible <laughs> <laughs> I'll be there tomorrow, funnily enough, so. <laughs> um, we were, Wondering if you might want to start off by saying a few words about the book and maybe reading a couple of pages. Yeah, I would love to. Well, first of all, um, Daniel, Larry, and, and, and Carl, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you to, to Boswell Books and, and Outwards. I mean, look, I, 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 I'm not the first person to say that, that all the work that independent booksellers like you are doing has um, just pretty much saved our sanity um, this past year. So, so first of all, even though you're not my own local bookstores, um, thank you on, on behalf of, of someone who, who has gotten so much kind of um, just, um, just uh, emotional support from, from my independent bookstores. So thank you. Um, yeah, so let's get back to the party. Um, it's my debut novel. Um, it's set in Washington, D.C. in the uh, year between the Supreme Court marriage ruling and the uh, Pulse nightclub shooting, so the summer of 2015 to 2016. Um, and really the novel is a character study and it follows um, these two estranged childhood friends named Sebastian and Oscar. Um, they meet at a wedding as adults, and the novel is really just kind of about th them searching for their place, um, kind of in their in their community as as gay men in 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 a, in a certain part of the community that's kind of torn between the past um, and the present. And um, this is kind of expressed through their somewhat obsessive relationships with gay men from um, different generations, from the generation before them, um, and then also the generation after them. And um, so I think I will just go ahead and we'll make it easy on everyone. And I'll just read the first few pages. So there is not much to set up. Um, I guess the only thing I should say is that this novel is told in alternating voices between each of the friends. So um, we'll be starting out with with Sebastian. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's it. So I'll just read for maybe three, four, five minutes and, um, and then we'll take it from there. All right, here we go. He arrived at the wedding dressed for a funeral. Sharp black suit, shiny black shirt, skinny black tie, polished black boots, black hair cresting over black sunglasses and a hokusai wave. I turned away from the grooms and watched him tiptoe to an empty back pew on the opposite side of the aisle. Oscar Burnham. I hadn't seen him in ten years, but underneath that violent head of hair, bull cut when we'd first met as children, shorn in rebellion when we'd last met as undergraduates, was the same slim boy slipping inside the ceremony like a snake. Would he remember me? Probably not. After the service, I stepped out of the church into the haze of another high Washington summer. I searched the crowd for Oscar, but couldn't find him, as if he just floated in and out of the wedding briefly like an errant leaf or a ghost. At the foot of the church steps, under a full tree draped in white ribbons, someone laughed. 
I heard a photographer attack the wedding party back inside. Loving it, the photographer said. Give me more. Cocktail hour. I lingered outside with a beer. Guests milled around the back lawn and garden of the Georgetown estate. Bar tables swaddled in white cloth and crowned with swollen floral arrangements dotted the clipped grass. Beyond that, in a brilliant patch of sunlight, the grooms posed for more photographs. Smiling, hugging, kissing, whispering, chucking their chins, nuzzling their noses. I'd been watching them for the past several minutes, forcing my face into a look of fondness so the other guests wouldn't realize I knew absolutely no one here. Danny, my date for the evening, had abandoned me for the restroom and a fresh glass of wine. There was nothing for me to do but stand there and sip, smiling at the people who passed by, at the couple out on the lawn, trying, unsuccessfully, not to dwell on my own recent uncoupling. There, Oscar's long black shape slicing through the space between wedding guests. It paused at the opposite end of the massive stone porch, leaned against a wrought iron balustrade, watched the grooms. No, he was no phantom. He was here, occupying physical space. To look at him, you'd think Oscar was in danger of being blown off the porch by the slightest breeze. He was so slender. He reminded me of something by Egon Schiele. Tall, lanky, otherworldly. With his eyes hidden behind those sunglasses, Oscar's gaze was mysterious, unreadable. He was all body, no expression. Across the lawn, the photographer signed a countdown from five. The wedding party, now regrouped, held hands and leapt in the air. The photographer, checking her camera, said, that's great, let's try it again. A groomsman said, Christ, I need a drink. Fragile grandparents, beer-bellied college buddies, nieces and nephews dolled up in flower dresses and loafers. Someone passed by me and whispered to his companion how great it was to finally be part of a gay wedding. The woman, I assume his wife, said, it's about time those two wild dogs settled down. Well, um, I'll go ahead and stop there. So you bring back Larry for a question. Um, and he will be back in a second. But I don't, <laughs> we did mention, um, why don't I start with the first question? Because you have, um, oh, there you are. Hello, Larry, would you like to do the first question? Go right ahead. All right, right. well, right I'm going to ask one that you probably were going to ask too, which is, um, how did you come to write the book? Yeah, so so this is, it's it's not autofiction, but it, but it certainly stems from my own experiences and the fact that, these these two main characters are 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 in their their mid thirties as as I was at, at the time that I I wrote the book, um, and, and it's really about it's it's less a novel about coming out and more a novel about coming into right coming out is its own is its own story fraught with its own kind of you know experiences but I, I was really interested in in kind of exploring through fiction the the conflicts that happen you know what what happens next like you you come out and so what. Right, like now you have to come into a community, right, and and that presents itself kind of with, with its own struggles, its its own joys, and and its own dilemmas, and and so this novel was really kind of a way to capture some of the emotions and and some of the feelings of of what it's like to be kind of a member of a of a hinge generation, right? So I, I, I have no personal experience whatsoever with with the AIDS plague and the generation before me. Um, it's you know it's it's not lived experience in any way. It's 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 history. I mean, even to the point where I I have friends now who are who are HIV positive, and and just saying those words doesn't carry the same the same kind of weight that it did um, twenty years ago. Um, and then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you have you know high schoolers who are. Um, operating in, in, in school systems where there's, there's certainly their own share of issues, but it's a lot more, there's a, a lot more visibility and they're taking same sex dates to, to proms and, and, and they're, you know, um, gay student alliances and, and all these things that I, as, as a closeted teen, never got to take advantage of as well. So it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of a, um, it's a feeling of, of, of kind of not really knowing Kind of, for lack of a better term, what your what your tribe is, if that makes sense. One well, of the questions that came in from our group was um, about the character of Sean. Yeah. And we're probably all interested in knowing if that is based on a particular 
well-known author that uh, we would know of. <laughs> I spent yeah. hours trying to thinking about that too. No, no, I'll, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but no, for, for several reasons. One of which is, is I, I don't know any of these authors well enough to, to write a kind of character based on them. I mean, they are, they are of the, the character of, of, of Sean Stokes, who is in his late sixties and, and, and is known for having, who gained popularity writing these very kind of, uh, ethnographic and, and very debaucherous stories of 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 his life in 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 the seventies and 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 then also you know in the eighties during the AIDS plague. Um, no, I mean most of these characters are honestly just Frankenstein characters. They're they're cobbled together from, you know, they may have the voice of a friend or um, the hair of of someone I I saw passing in the street one day. Um, no, no, abs absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Oh, not. you're protesting too much. No, I. Who I, did you I, think it was? I, I. Well, who do you think it was? I'm there gonna go, go Larry first. Hmm? Who, who do we think it was? Yeah. Well, there, there's a guy I have in mind, but I don't want to. I don't want to pin that on you. Oh, I'll do okay. it. I don't have any problems. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I, what, one thing I was reading, um, Jim Gladstone's review, who's, he wrote a book called The Big Book of Misunderstanding that I actually read and hosted an event for him many years ago. Yeah. Um, and he said, he's just like, well, it has to be Edmund White. This is obviously Edmund White. And, yeah. um, and, there's, and there's definitely parallels, though. I thought of Andrew Holleran a little too. Sure, sure. And, um, yeah, I, I thought of also Felice Oh, see, I'm not familiar with that name. So it's so it's definitely it's definitely not it's definitely him. not him. You've never heard of him. <laughs> yeah, I give you a whole bunch of other people you haven't heard of. So, Larry, now are you willing to say who you thought it might be? I, oh, I was thinking of Edmund White. Yeah, Edmund White. Yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I, 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 I guess at at the risk of wow, this is this is I've been doing this for a couple weeks now. This is the most intense question I've I've ever gotten. <laughs> um, <laughs> really. I, you, no, no, no. Uh, you know, I, I will say, I don't think, I don't consider Sean Stokes to be as good of a writer as Edmund White. So I would say, no, he is, he is definitely not Edmund White. The, the, the thing that, that in my interpretation of, 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 of Sean Stokes and, and his work and, and his popularity is, it, again, it's, it's, it's really just all derived from, from, from capturing a, a um, a, a, a slice of life in, in a community in a particular time and place. And, and there's nothing, there's nothing literary about it. And there's certainly nothing literary in the reasons why Oscar is so enamored with him as a person and, and with his work. I, uh, Oscar could care less, I think, about, about literary styles and, and what constitutes, um, you know, beautiful writing. So now you're kind of leading me along to what another question was going to be, which is was to ask if Sean was in fact really a literary or a good writer. Yeah, well, I'll I'll leave that up to the reader to decide. I, I mean, I, again, like the question, the question's more for Oscar. Well, but see, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think. Uh, but but I don't I don't I don't so Oscar's not a reader right so I don't I don't consider him as as perceiving Sean in that way again he's he's not gravitating towards Sean as a writer I think he's gravitating towards him as this as this representative either for good or ill of 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 a time when when being queer was was more rebellious and and you know Oscar for for all his misgivings, would, would rather would rather be hated than ignored, um, and so I think that's part of that's part of the allure that um, that Sean has for him is 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 you know people people paid more attention to you um, than than he feels that that people are are paying attention to him now. Well, one of the things that I thought was so interesting about your the time period is you know in terms of popular culture, the mm -hmm. marriage the gay marriage was kind of viewed as this everybody's so happy Every, you know the queer community now we've got everything we need and and I thought that you did a really great job in terms of the two characters at bringing out the both sides because you know as you know from my perspective at least you know from my past that certainly wasn't what a lot of people were looking for at all yeah yeah 
I mean, there, there are a lot of, but, but see that then someone of my generation, you know, I, I, I remember hearing like the first arguments about, well, like maybe gay marriage isn't such a great idea. And, and, you know, based on my experience, my initial reaction was, well, wait, what, why? Um, but so that the, there is, there is nevertheless, I think, regardless of, of, of whether you're for it or against it, and I don't even think it's really a matter of that, there, there's a nuanced argument on, on both sides. And there is something to be said for, um, cultural change, right? And, and what that means. I, I remember uh, maybe just a couple years after I'd come out, I'd, I'd started seeing all these think pieces about the death of gay culture, right? And, and I remember saying the death of gay culture, I just got here, like it's dying. Um, but when, when, you know, when we talk about cultural death, I think what we're really talking about is, is, is cultural change, right? And, and, and as is, is true of, of all sorts of progress, right? Like for something, for everything that's gained, there's also something that's that's lost now. Whether whether those are equal or not, I you know is 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 an argument to be had. But yeah, you you bring up the question of um, how did you acclimate yourself to be able to put words and thoughts in Sean's head since his generation is so removed. Um, I have, I have dear friends of mine who are, who are of, um, a similar generation, um, to him. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've read a lot of the literature of the time, just not even, not even in terms of researching this book, but just for my own, um, my own pleasure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, 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 I mean, this is, this is part of, of, of writing outside your experience, right, is, is you, you eventually have to make these kind of empathetic leaps. Um, but I think what makes it easier is, and this, this sounds very, it sounds like a very trite thought, but just, you know, treating people outside my own experiences as just as, just as human and as complicated and, and as messy and, and hypocritical as, as I am. I mean, you did a really great job with both Sean and also Arthur, you know, you. Oh, thank you. I mean, I thought, you know, I mean, it's, that's, it, it's a love, beautifully structured book. The way you know each character, the characters, sort of the the I don't know. They're friends. What are they? Frenemies? I, yeah, I like I like that term, frenemies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, I, I've thought I I thought about this often when I was writing it as as you know this isn't a love story so much as 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 a cockfight, pun intended. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so let's let's go with frenemies. Frenemies works. Frenemies works. <laughs> and you know how they have this parallel intergenerational sort of relation. You know, each person with an older person or, or the younger person. Yeah. Um, I feel like if you written this book twenty or thirty years ago, that there would have been a little more sexual tension with the younger person than you would be allowed to have now. Um, I but I thought so. you did a you did a good job of sort of representing that in the in the Oscar character. You know, yeah, well, um, you know, Daniel, to, to come to to come to my defense, I I didn't I didn't shy away from 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 an outright sexual relationship with with either of the characters and their and their kind of generational foils, not not out of out of out of out of any kind of prudery, but simply for for the idea that that what is it that that Oscar and Sebastian desire about these characters, and oh. and I don't think that that desire is is inherently sexual, or if it is, it's it's tied up in just in just so many other things that I I don't I I never I never approached it as um, you know it, it it just being purely about about physical lust and and in fact early in the book um oscar makes that mistake and kind of awkwardly propositions sean because he thinks that's what that's what sean wants and and that's what's right. expected and he ends up making a fool of himself um but it was it, it was about a desire that that was not inherently physical or or, right. or sexual and, and it was a little more complicated than that and that that was kind of what interested me in in these relationships but also leaving room for the fact, well, you know, it's, it's not, it's not an entirely kosher infatuation either. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. And I, I would say that obsession and is not always <coughs> physical, you know, it, or, or, or even if, if we think it is, it's much more. Right. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah, there's just, there's, there's so much, so much more at work there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I, Larry, do you have another, would you like to go? Well, I, I've asked three questions in a row now. Why don't you take oh. <laughs> um, One of the things I was fascinated by, uh, as was Larry, about the artwork in the, uh, described in the book. Yeah. Um, would you like to talk about how, you know, the importance of, of, of art to the story? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. So I, I guess to, to set up, there are, there are multiple, for people who haven't read it, there are multiple sections in the Sebastian narrative where the character is somewhat processing his, his memories and, and, and his past relationships with, with Oscar and, and with the other men in his life. And, and through the lens of, of works of art, he's, he's an art history teacher. He loves reading art catalogs and, and going to art museums. And so he's constantly encountering art. And so using art as a, as a way to kind of filter his, his personal history. The, the reason I did that was, was, a, it was just too much damn fun to write. And I, and I think that we, you know, we, we often think that writing has to be, you know, a terrible drudge, you know, and, and it is, don't get me wrong, but I just had so much fun writing them, those passages that I wanted to keep them in. So, so there was that that was purely selfish. Um, but on the other hand, it, it was really a way to capture my own experience with art. And, and I suspect the experiences that other people have and that when you engage with with a painting or or a novel or a piece of music right you're you're engaging it on one level you're having a conversation with the person who who made that work but then there's also a second conversation going on and that's the conversation that you're you're having with yourself and and what this particular piece of 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 art or music or or what have you um Kind of it, it inspires or, or or kind of ignites in in, in your own head and, and maybe in your emotional history and so that was my that was I, I just felt that that made a it, it just seemed very in character that this is how um, a, a man who who lives inside his his head constantly would would process his own memories. You had mentioned this painting had particular significance for uh, the the Watson and the Shark painting. Yeah, if you if you give me one second, I. Um, I'll find the um, appropriate passage. So I guess to kind of set up that particular painting, which which I love, it hangs in the National Gallery of Art here in DC. I, I've, I've been infatuated with the painting since I was a kid. I just loved sharks. I mean, this was this was well before I, I, I paid any attention to the fact that there's a very handsome naked man um, in the water. Um, and, and so this particular painting, be, ends up having um, very significant resonance throughout um, the novel. And so I'll read really quickly the one of these, these kind of art themed passages um, that, that centers on, on this painting and is the first time that, that we as readers encounter it. All right, so this is Watson and the Shark, John Singleton Copley, 1788. And this is Sebastian. I'm on a field trip with my third grade class to the National Gallery of Art. My mother is a chaperone keeping up the rear behind a group of eight kids who follow the docent through the galleries. We find ourselves in front of an enormous oil painting. That doesn't look like a shark, someone says. That's because it was invented by Mr. Copley, the docent explains. Someone asks, why is that man naked? I think it's a girl, someone else says. Look at her long hair. A new kid, Oscar Burnham, asks, did he die? No, the docent says. The young man was rescued. He lived a long, happy life. Later, during lunch on the grass outside the museum, I see the new kid sitting alone. He looks lonely, my mother says. Go over and talk to him. I take my lunch and sit next to the new kid, the two of us at a slight remove from the rest of the group. You just moved near my house, I say. I know, the new kid says. I see you playing outside from my bedroom. Come out next time, I say. The new kid just has carrots with his ham sandwich, so I share my grapefruit roll-ups. We spend the rest of lunch pressing small squares of dried fruit into the roofs of our mouths. We attach small strips to our tongues and pretend we're lizard people. Cool. At, at a certain point, um, Sebastian becomes aware that the way he perceives Arthur is a face 
that he has seen in a piece of art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To what extent is that influencing the way Sebastian perceives Arthur? Mm. Uh, I, I would I, I would say Larry very much so in 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 my opinion. Um, I mean, there, there, there is, there is not just with Sebastian, but with Oscar, there is this, there's this constant obsession between what do we value more, the, the person or the image of the person, right? And, and so there was a deliberate choice for me not to extend the narrative voice to encompass Arthur and Sean. Everything that the, we, the reader, know, knew about them had to be filtered through the biased perspectives of 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 Sebastian um, and Oscar. So so really, their their obsession is is with with images, right? And and so the way that that Sebastian kind of perceives Arthur through this Caravaggio painting, the musicians, or or more appropriately through a figure in that painting. Um, I also wanted that to subtly mirror the way that that um, that Oscar kind of perceives men. Um, on the on on the hookup app um, in this in this novel, which which is itself, when you think about it, a, a it is itself an, an art gallery, right? A, a collection of squares of of different body parts, and and you know you're you're appreciating the image, but you're not really getting any insight into into the person on on which that image is based. So it, so that that was kind of a way of 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 bringing that all together and and adding and kind of creating just another kind of thematic link between between their two journeys. If I, if I recall correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, wasn't there at some point an opportunity for Sebastian to mention that he saw Arthur in this painting and Arthur responds, I don't see it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I don't have a good follow-up art question. So if you have one, Larry, you should ask another one. Yeah. Uh, uh, or, or we can jump. <laughs> I'm like, I ran out without talking about the page. <laughs> like the point to mention that if there are questions from other observers, use the chat function at the bottom of your, of your screen and we will see your question. Just type your question in there and we will, we will relay it. I, I, I'm still stuck on, uh, probably not fair, Zach, but I'm still stuck on Arthur saying, I don't see it. What, what kind of signal was that to Sebastian? Was it? Oh, well, Larry, I, I can't give up my, my secrets. No magician, you know, gives up their secrets. I, it's, uh, it's, it, 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 it's, I really don't want to dodge your question, Larry, but it's, it's no. complicated. I mean, it's- it's. Let me rephrase the question so that you don't yeah. have to- Okay, go for it. Spells. Um, when I read that, it felt cataclysmic, except it wasn't. How is that possible? Mm, but 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 it, maybe it is cataclysmic for Sebastian. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, again, that there, there's. If I if I'm understanding your question correctly, what that suggests, or or what I was trying to imply, is is just just this kind of 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 difference in perception that these two characters have, right? Like right. to 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 Arthur it's it's just a silly painting in his classroom, right? But to Sebastian it's it's this very this very potent and and, and very vital kind of pseudo-sexual reminder of 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 a childhood that that and a child that that he wasn't. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Does, I, I don't want to push you beyond that. Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. So <laughs> <laughs> except except when it's a cigar in a gay novel and then it's not the same <laughs> we'll <give you> that. <laughs> what were some of the ways that you tried to play up the generational differences between the three sets of characters you know were you were you like did you do research on like like how did you, i mean was it mostly did you interview you said you did you know folks um, Sean's age, but like, or or for Arthur, I assume you know folks Arthur's age. But like, what, like, in your mindset, you you know, to give these characters of very different ages and very different experiences, yeah, uh, different yeah. perspectives. What kind of stuff did you do? I mean, I, I honestly, I, oh, is that me or? Oh, anyway, sorry, there was some feedback. Um, you know, from my perspective, I think YouTube was a big help. I mean, there's just a, a treasure trove of of interviews with 
gay men from all sorts of, of different generations. I mean, what a, what a, what a wonderful resource it is for, um, for um, someone trying to, to come out today to just have just that, that kind of wealth of, of information and, and, and perspective and personal experience. Um, so, you know, I, I did do some research, but again, I, 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 I deliberately did not want to overwhelm myself with research, he says, trying not to pretend that he's just lazy. Um, because again, like, like the perceptions of these, of these two kind of bracket generations uh, um, are, are really all filtered through, through my own experience, if that makes sense. So, so you know, I, I wanted to do enough research on, on either ends to certainly make it believable and credible um, and human. But again, remember, we're seeing these generations through the lens of, of 230-something men. So, so in that regard, I, I, I already had that kind of emotional and, and, and historical knowledge up front, if that makes sense. Actually, it does. Um, was, you know, one of the things I think probably the 60-something, um, Sean would probably have gone through a moment where when he was young that he thought there was probably nobody else like him. Arthur would never probably think that. Right, it's, 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 so, it's so foreign, absolutely, yeah. And, and really? just, that, 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 just that, that gap of, that historical gap of experience, I, I just, I find so incredibly fascinating and, and the ways in, in which that can be bridged and also the, the ways in, in, in which it can't, right? I mean, I, I think a lot about how I could, I could read narratives of, of losing friends and lovers to, to AIDS until I'm blue in the face, but I, I will still never be able to say that that, that that was my experience. It's just impossible because of, of the time and, and circumstances of, of my birth and, and the way that time moves forward. So, you know, one can certainly educate oneself and, and, and develop a, a very robust sense of empathy with people who had lives or experiences different than your own. But at the end of the day, like Oscar and Sebastian, I am a 38-year-old man with, with my own kind of experiences of, 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 of both joy, queer joy and queer happiness and, and, and queer, you know, shame and, and, and trauma. Um, and so another reason why I wanted to set this novel specifically between 2015 and 2016 is, you know, these, these two very public events, right? The, the, the passing of, of the Supreme Court ruling, which is this moment of just very public joy um, and then almost a year later, the Pulse nightclub shooting, which is just this I incredible moment of, of, of public trauma. You know, I, 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 I didn't have to go to a history book to, to learn about that, right? Like it, in that regard, those are two very important events for, for the gay community and, and for the queer community that, that I, you know, I, I, I don't want to say I experienced firsthand, but, but I was there for that, right? I, I don't have to you know, I, I, I experienced it the way that most of us experienced it, right? Which, which is a, as an event on, on television and, and, and social media and, you know, on, on my phone. Um, those were two kind of very important moments in, in, in queer history in America that, that, that I was around for and, and that I was conscious of as a gay man, right? As, as, an, as an open gay man. They affect your life. I mean, each of, both of those events affect your life. Yes, and not historically, but uh, certainly uh, more so than just reading about them in the history books. They're they're current and they affect Zach. Right. Yes. Absolutely, Larry. Yeah. Uh, perhaps we should move on to some questions that are get that are coming in. Aaron Wilder asks, "Hello, Zach. I've noticed you mentioned in another virtual talk or two that Sebastian and Oscar." Are on two opposite ends of a spectrum. Mm -hmm. To me, although so far I'm only halfway through, they strike me as very similar in their loneliness and isolation as they come into, as you've called it, the queer community they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little about the similarities as opposed to the differences of the two main characters? Mm. The similarities 
Um, if, if you'll indulge me in a little kind of armchair psychology, right? So, so either character operates on, on these very emotional extremes, right? There's Sebastian who is, who is very melancholic and, and lives in his head. And then there's Oscar who is just, excuse me, consumed with outrage, right? And so there's this, there's this popular psychological idea, right? That, that depression is just rage turned inward, right? And, and rage is just an outward manifestation of, of depression. So if, if, if you'll kind of indulge me in that, I feel like that answers Aaron's question, Aaron, your question, um, in the sense that, that, that they are, both of these characters are living on these very emotional extremes. But these emotions are 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 very very similar. Just the the, the difference is, is in how they're manifested. I th I, th I feel like there are a lot of of through lines in my own my own personal experiences between you know sadness and and, and anger for whatever reason. I mean the two emotions are are never far apart. Mm -hmm. um, we should we do another question um, from Joel uh, Buchanan. You feel that some of the characters are heroic in the novel. Do you see any of the characters as emotionally flawed? I hope so, but um, what's, your, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'd hope that they're, that they're all flawed. Um, I, I, I tend to enjoy messy people in, in, in the kind of art that I consume. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I deliberately wanted them to be messy. And, and one of the things that that held me back at the beginning was, I mean, when you write about a, a, a marginalized community, you, you are taking upon yourself a, a very incredible responsibility, right? Um, you know, you are, you are providing your, your own voice. Um, and <laughs> just at the risk of sounding like a jerk, um, I, I, I said, screw it. I'm, I'm going to write these characters as, and, and I'm going to have them be as, as, as messy and, and extreme and as interesting as, as I find the characters in, in the fiction that I enjoy to be. Um, it, was, it was just an incredible relief to not have to feel any sort of obligation to, you know, kind of create these, these spit shine statues of, of, of gay men for, for public consumption, right? I, I, I don't believe that I, you know, I, I have to, um, you know, I, I, I don't believe that I have to present these characters as anything but human, right? I, I, my job is not to convince the reader of the inherent dignity and self-worth of gay men and, and queer people. This is something that, 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 that any child with a working knowledge has. And, I, and you know, I, I don't feel like I, as a storyteller, should have to waste my time or, or, or somehow um, <coughs> dilute the emotional extremes of the story that I want to tell because I'm worried about how the reader will think of the gay men and, and, and the queer people in their life. I, I just, I, I like to pretend or I like to believe that, that most readers are, are intelligent enough um, um, for that. Now, now, having said that, these, these, these stories of, of very positive, uplifting messages, they're absolutely important. They're absolutely worthwhile stories. And there are plenty of people out there who, who need those stories, who need to hear those stories, and who need to tell those stories. But those stories don't interest me, um, either as a writer and, and, and a reader. So that is why I, I chose not to write this novel, um, really kind of paying too much attention about how the people I was portraying came across. To, to me, to me, they're they're human. And just as 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 gay men and queer people are are human, like flaws, flaws and all. And I, you know, who who wants to read about happy people anyway? It's well, so it is it is interesting though, because you do find, you know, and this happens with a lot of um, marginalized cultural identities where, you know, we're so used to having sort of own only being fed negative imagery and so much of the community then wants everything to be very positive. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I had noticed about so much gay fiction is that it almost is effectively, you know, whether it's high end, like call me by your name or low or, or more commercial, like red, white, and royal blue, they're all, they're effectively roaming. They're not, they're, you know, you were talking about the coming out story of, 
you know, which is so much of my 80s and 90s reading, it's like, these aren't even coming out stories. They're just romances. The coming yeah, out yeah. Is, doesn't need to be happened. We're just gonna, you know, we just have to fall in love and be happy or fall in love and not be happy. And one yeah, of the yeah. things I really liked about this book is that you blindsided. Like I was like, at one point I started reading the book. I'm like, oh, this book is, I was calling it to everybody. Oh, this is book is When Needy Met Cheedy. And I'm sure there's that book. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, I know it in my own I know the people in my own life. I was the yeah, third wheel yeah. and like, oh God, I have to listen to this again about how mistreated this person is. But you didn't do that. You 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 went in a different direction, which I love. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Because I, I I I absolutely wanted to. I um I you know, I mean you 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 said it best earlier, like this is about frenemies. I frenemies are are so much more interesting than 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 people who who um you know and and I'm a sucker for love stories too but but again I I the the, the messiness and and the awkwardness I think just interests me so much more than than that but um yeah um because art is such an important part of Sebastian's life I wonder if you would just tell us a little bit about your deep connection with art. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the art that's on the wall behind you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, wow, oh, that's an interesting mix. <laughs> what is in your own background that helped you define Sebastian in that way? Well, in terms of Sebastian, I mean, he's the, the art he appreciates is, is they're all very relatively well-known pieces in the sense that they're pieces that you're going to encounter if you're an art history teacher, like they will be on an exam, they will be in an art history book. Um, they, they certainly do skew towards the, um, the, the, the Western tradition, of course. Um, and, and I suppose there are, there are ways to, there are things to, to read into that. Um, in terms of my own particular, um, um, interests in, in, in art, I mean, it's, I, I'm just drawn to to whatever uh, elicits a, a response in me. It's like obscenity. I, I I just I know it when I see it, right? I I know something, you know, connects with me when I see it, and 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 I think part of the part of the beauty is trying. Part of the beauty and the frustration is trying to express in words, you know, what that connection is and and why I find something so 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 visually appealing um in a particular painting or, or 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 sculpture and um i haven't quite been able to to put to put my finger on it i wish i could say that i was obsessed with you know one particular artist or or one particular school um of of of, of painting but it's 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 just i you know i'm just gluttonous i just try and and, and see and consume as 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 much as i can and and some of it just washes over me and and some of it is like wow like i can't imagine my life before i didn't before i you know before not having seen that well, that particular a, painting art history teacher which who set you on that path no you know I, I only took one art history course and that was a general education course in college um so I, I wasn't even a, a scholar of, of art history. I did have an English teacher, however, in, in 10th grade who, um, who was an, and is a collagist. And so he would treat his classroom as, as just these giant, you know, collages of, of, of student artwork and, 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 and other artwork and, and things that he just found interesting. And, and that was definitely the way that Sebastian treats his classroom is, is most certainly an homage to that to that English teacher of mine. Good answer. <laughs> A1. Um, we were just looking at, you know, being that we talked a little about your artistic um, interests and things like that, we're interested in uh, a few things about, right, you know, we are, we are two bookstores after all. Yeah. Um, a little about some writers that might have inspired you and they might be some very left field, unexpected ones, and then some other ones you like that you might want to talk about. Yeah, writer, little books with us. writers that inspired me. Um, you know, I'm a very insecure person. So when I was actually drafting this, I tried to stay away from fiction about gay men, not, not out of a fear of being influenced, I think, so, being, so much as a fear of being discouraged 
by just how 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 great how there are just so many wonderful writers and, and so many stories out there. Um, but but I guess in terms of kind of my aesthetic approaches to this, um, you know, I, I think of, of of writers like like Maggie Nelson and and Carmen Maria Machado. I mean, from them, I I. I really take to heart the idea that that form can be just as much of um, the, the way that a story is structured and, and the form that it takes can have just as much of an impact as, as the sentences that you use. Um, another um, particularly gay male writer who, um, who I love and, and, and who really kind of teaches me about ways to treat time is, is Alan Hollinghurst, mm. uh, right? So books like The Stranger's Child or The Sparshold Affair, where you have these, these kind of gaps between chapters and sections. And it's almost like you have to spend the first few pages of, of a new section, you know, trying to get caught up and, 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 you know, kind of get your bearings and like, oh, this character is so much older now, or, or wait, this character died all of a sudden? How did that happen? Um, that 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 kind of engagement and the way that that kind of the stretches vast stretches of time can be compressed into you know 300 400 pages i i just find incredibly inspiring um oh, i'm just I gonna got, say you i just want to say you might not have been i know you there's definitely i read the book and i was like ooh, i'll hang there's telling her you know there's definitely oh you've cool got, good, good. you got the especially you know the early his early books you know especially with oscar and the the internalized obsession, um, his comic novel, the third novel, because your book is um, is funny, you know, um, which I love. So, oh, thanks. Uh, no, but yeah, nice. I I I I can definitely see the through line there. So yeah, and I mean, I you know, I could I could just go on and, and name drop for the rest of the evening. I mean, Garth Greenwell, Alexander Chi, uh, you know, people like Peter Kispert and and, and Pat, Patrick Nathan. Um, you know, I could I could just go go on and on. I mean, this is this is this is the wonderful the wonderful thing is that there are so many. At least it seems to me now more than when I was younger. So many, you know not just gay male writers, but queer writers out there writing just incredible books that, that the general public is, is consuming and that it's not, you know, niche storytelling anymore. And this is, this is a wonderful, um, excuse me, just a, a, yeah, it just, it feels like a very wonderful, vibrant time um, to be reading queer fiction, let alone to, to be doing my own small contribution to it. Um, there was, it was, it was interesting, and I'm sure Larry can speak to this as well, is there was this sort of golden age in the 80s and early 90s, and then really all the major publishers basically got out of the field altogether. They basically said, it's not working, Dutton closed up their program, St. Martin's closed up their program, Viking disappeared, um, the pocket <laughs> editor at one point was allowed to publish one gay book a year, that's it, that's what he was allowed to do. And um, I don't want to even say what he wanted to publish instead. Um, and then, you know, in terms of women, like I would read, I was just, I've been indexing old books. What, um, uh, you know, there were some really great things, Bastard Out of Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I can go on. I, I'm trying to remember if Revolution of Little Girls by Blanche McCurry Boyd was um, lesbian or not. But oh, it I'm seemed like it, with that book. Oh, it's an obscure book, but it's, it's got a, I'm obsessed with old Knopf books with beautiful top stains. Um, oh, so okay. okay. I didn't throw it away. Um, I'll let you know afterwards what. Please do. No one's ever heard of it, but it's um, it was a book that I really loved. I mean, um, I'm, yeah, I'm 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 woefully there. Are, there are just some shameful gaps in my in my my reading of 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 you know certain queer writers, and I used to feel very self conscious about this, but now. I'm very excited, right? Because all these other people have already had the, the experience of reading these books for the first time. They'll never get to have that particular experience again. So like, this is, you know, I, I, I have yet to read Proust, which I admit is, is a shame, but when I do, um, I'll be reading it for the first time. And, and you know, what a, what a wonderful experience that, that must be, just to use one example. Larry, if you were gonna tell somebody to read one book or author who would- Yeah, here we go. This is a great question. I would love it if, if both of you would give me one, not to turn the tables, but if both of you would give me one book that I should, I should order from your establishments tomorrow. 
what oh, it's out of print, whatever I... <laughs> <laughs> What's yours, Larry? Author. Let me think about it. Yeah, okay. this is a tough one. Right. Um, yeah, I, there, there were some really obscure... I, I did a blog post about your book and I was trying to remember like various books that it recalled. So I can go back to that. Um, I liked the first Robert Farrow book, The Family of Max Desir a lot, but I did not like the next one. And then the next one I liked, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Things like that. Um, but that was, that was in the old kind of area. There was a book that a whole bunch of us died of AIDS too, um, John Fox. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, Aaron Wilder would like to say Naked by David Sedaris. Yeah, and I always think okay. of all right. I always think of Sedaris as being the next gen a little. Um, but, yeah, yeah. But it was so that was like you know what Sedaris was. Sedaris was the second author that I knew, gay author that was seemed to be more liked by straight people than gay people. Like we would have a Sedaris event, and like I don't see any gay people in this. You know, whatever. The yeah. first one was. Tales of the, was Armistead Muffins, Tales of the right, City. Right, right, right. Like, yes. I went to college and Tales of the City, I went to college in the 70s. Every dorm room had Tales of the City in it. And I'm like, wow, this is a real hip and happening college. It was not. Yeah. Well then, well, well, how do you feel How do you feel now that most people I think probably of, of, of my generation and younger think of it as a television show and not, um, you know, not originally a, a short story collection. I've, I've read the, I've read the, the, the books. But my introduction to them was most certainly not the books. It was it was the um, the old television show. You know, the new the one case, which I haven't seen. It's yep. the case for some. There's probably some people who don't know that Harry Potter was a book. So you know, or <laughs> or so you know, John Lewis was a book. Oh, yeah. But um, no, so I I don't care. I do love I love the books because of that um, uh, sort of uh, newspaper like element. The column. You know the short segment. There was a book. Um, I don't know if you've ever read a guy named Peter Cameron, who is um, I love Up and Down. His new book actually just got shortlisted for Los Angeles. Yes, I, mean, I, I loved that book. Well, I liked I I liked it. I wrote a rec for it, but I was sort of shocked because okay. it was so quiet otherwise. Um, so I'm so glad you read it. Um, yeah, I, I love. Yeah, I'm a whore for quiet literature, so that <laughs> book was just right up my alley. He's one of his books um, called the Oh gosh, one of his books is one of my favorite books of all time, and of course I don't remember it. But um, that's the only book of his I've I've read is this most recent. Uh, I love the weekend. Okay. I loved Coral Glynn, which was the book before. That's almost an homage to Barbara Pym. Okay, okay. he's a big. Him. You can tell from the book that he's a big pimp. All right, did you, Larry? Did you think of your book? No. All right. I'll keep. I'm like, I'm in my fiction section. I'm like, what about this? What about this? What about this? I have to get up and go to my fiction section. That's before I need the the prompts. <laughs> so this is. I was thinking of this cover, which was, um, you know, is is. I don't know what to think about it. I mean, it's an amazing cover. But all, yeah, I could, yeah. all I could think, the first, the only cover I thought of, this is going to embarrass me by showing you. It was a book that I, was actually a really funny book. <laughs> well, well, you know. I, I'm just screaming. <laughs> Al Algonquin uh, did not present me with a cover like that. No. Uh, this is the, this is the, the first. I have no that. idea what this cover was supposed to do, but <laughs> it was from Simon and Schuster and I liked it. Um, so I love the book called Sacred Lips of the Bronx by Douglas Sedanik. I like okay, okay. early um, Jaime Manrique. Um, I've been reading all that, you know, I've been reading all the, I read Real Life and I read Memorial and, um, you know, all the, all the, the new. Uh, Carl, Carl says, Carl says Nebraska by George Whitmore. I'm not familiar. Oh, yeah. I'm not familiar with that. I'll have to, have to write that down. Wow, I wrote this book just to get all these reading recommendations. Yeah, <laughs> it was all know, worth it. Especially the book reminded me a little. It's less uncomfortable with, um, I read all the books from Michael Lowenthal, who has a new short story collection. He's going to be doing an event with Stephen McCauley at the store in April. And he wrote a book <laughs> called Avoidance that this book reminded me of a tiny bit. Um, it came out from Grey Wolf a number of years ago. Okay, okay. 
I mean, they're, gosh, they're, I, I, I hope don't want to get in trouble. They're a great publisher too. I mean, I, I love Algonquin, don't get me wrong, but they, Grey Wolf publishes some great, um, yeah, I could, some great yeah. books, including, um, I would recommend um, From Hell, which was a, a, the debut novel by Patrick Nathan, um, which I read. Oh yeah, you had mentioned Patrick Nathan. Couple, I have a couple of years ago. And it did just, you read it? I did, I did. It's, it's, yeah, it's, no, you read it. I met Larry. Oh, ha, just kidding. You recommended it to me. I hope you read it. <laughs> I'm trying to think of the author, a Vietnamese author. Um, Ocean Vuong? Yes, I think that's Yeah, it. That's, on that's, Earth, that's... We Are All Beautiful, I can't get the title. On, 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 Earth, on, Earth? We're brief, on Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous. That, that book is so, is so beautiful that it just, it hurts. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know if, if other writers feel this way, but when I read that book, I just thought, well, fuck, why am I, why even bother, right? <laughs> It's all it's all been said so and told so so beautifully. It's 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 uncanny how um, how beautiful that book is. We're, I'm waiting to the paperback because I need to be. I'm we have a. I just work with a book club too in our store. It's a, just a general book club, but I like. I thought, oh, I need to talk about this book with other people afterwards. After <laughs> but I think it's coming out in paperback in June. Oh, Todd Wellman, good friend of the store. James McGruder, uh, both stories actually. James McGruder's Love Slaves of Helen Hadley Hall. You read that? Yes. Did anyone read that? Mm -mm. No. We but talked I, will, I will make a note of that, Todd. Don't Thank you. you. Read it. We, we talked about it in the book group. Oh, you did? How about um, Zach? Oh, then Joel wants to know what have we got? What are you working on now? Oh, Joel. Uh, oh, Joel. How to, how, to, how, to, how to dodge this question appropriately. I, I, am, I am definitely working on, on a couple projects that I'm very excited about, but I, I feel very hesitant to, to talk about them in any greater detail. But rest assured, Joel, that they are certainly, most certainly queer in some, in some way, shape, or form. So You can write whatever you want to write. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I oh I will, Daniel. Don't worry. I don't feel I don't feel any pressure to write anything but what I want to want. It just so happens that these projects right. are clear. It yeah. sounded like Joel was putting pressure on you to make sure that your next book was clear enough. That's all oh, I was no. Oh no. Oh. I didn't I didn't think so at all. And maybe that's the pressure I put on myself. Ah. <laughs> Do we have any other questions before we go? So I'm not seeing any others come in. Now we as we mentioned before, uh, when we end the event, we're going to have a little spoiler session where um, the, the, the men's book club and anyone else who'd like to, who's read the book, can stay on. So, um, so I think with that... I have oh, yeah. another question from John Eklund. Oh, yeah? He simply writes, favorite authors. But I think we've kind of covered that, haven't we? Yeah, yes. yeah, definitely the the I, I would say in, in terms of of perhaps non queer authors, um, absolutely um, people like Philip Roth and 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 Don DeLillo. I I kind of I kind of cut my teeth on in in the early two thousands, and yeah, I I love them. So yeah, heavy like ah. Yeah. Did, did you, you say know, did you say pantheon, pantheon stuff you know <laughs> um i was just gonna say a book that came out this past year that also i think just got shortlisted for the national book critic circle award that i really loved was uh if i had two wings by randall keenan um i i did i did read that short story collection it was it was wonderful i'm, I'm ashamed to say that that i i only I, I only came, that book only came to my attention because of his passing. Um, but um, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And I, I want to go read all his other stuff as well. There's, it's mostly nonfiction. There's one other novel. And there's Short Street Collection from 1992. <laughs> oh, right, right, right. right. That's the other one. And then you said there's mostly, is it, isn't there a... Um, he has a book on James Baldwin. That's what I was going to say. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think, do you have any final question, Larry, before we Marty, transition? Marty has a comment for the panelists. He says, oh. non-queer author essential is Carl Capek, War in War with the Newts, or three novels, or Duval, Meteor, and Ordinary Life. Okay, Thank you. thanks, Martin. We're going to close out this portion of the evening. Thanks to everybody 
Uh, thank you from Outwards. Thank you from Boswell. And hope to see you at another event. Uh, we thank you very much, everyone. Virtual bookstores without you.